So what I'm going to give you right now, I think is a helpful thing. I don't know about you, but I really value knowing a book in a nutshell. And we've been working through Romans for a, for a week or two. And um, we're almost through with the book of Romans. And uh, I'm, I'm thankful for Romans. It is a meaty book. It is a substantial book. It is a grace-filled book, a gospel-focused book. Uh, but let me give you, after going through it, here is the fruit for me in terms of, I guess as a pastor, I have to find three points in everything, right? Uh, no, I, it's not that I look for three points. These three points just seem to be, maybe Paul was that good three-point preacher. And here are three found, fundamental, foundational things that are in Romans. You can write these down. In chapters 1 to 8, we really saw, and it's the series title, right? The guts of the gospel from our need for the gospel through what the gospel is. You know, that the righteous live by faith. The gospel is the righteousness of Jesus Christ given to us freely by grace through faith. One to eight, guts of the gospel. And then the second major focus of Paul in chapters 9 to 11. And, and that was the title. What's this, the title of this series? You see it on the, the marquee every week. Chosen to serve. When you look at chapters 9 to 11, they are all about being chosen. What a gracious thing. Not because we deserve it. Because of, because, because of God and his wisdom from all eternity has chosen us, but not chosen to sit, chosen to serve. And then finally we look at chapters 12 to 16, 12 to the end. And it is Paul's final focus. And if we were to have a, a separate series title for these last chapters, it would be Transformed to Serve. Transformed. So you've got the guts of the gospel. What is it? And then we're chosen to serve, and then we are transformed to serve. And I think in a nutshell, that is the book of Romans. I know you didn't think I could be concise, but that's a whole book in three points. So, here in chapter 16, remember with me now, Paul has painted a masterpiece. And it is a portrait of the transformed in the church in Rome. At least, it's a, it, it's a, it's a compilation of colors and brush strokes of all the people there that when combined... And we step back, we see a picture of Christ. And, and so what has stood out, it is the variety of colors, the variety of people, the variety of giftedness, the, the variety of attributes that those people, those transformed by the gospel to serve in Rome. It, it's that diversity that makes the painting. And I think I mentioned one time going to the, the Fort Worth Art Museum and seeing a canvas of red, I'm like, that's not art. Yeah, it's just a painting is it's red. But it's the diversity of the color that makes, when you go to, to the museums and you see the Monets and, and the Degas and all those masterpieces, it's the, it's the combination of all the colors in, in unique ways. And we said that this portrait that Paul's doing, it's in the, it's in the genre of pointillism, right? He's got these little points of people but then all together, just make this picture of Christ. And so, let me just say this morning, maybe you feel really different than the rest of the people here. And, 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 and the enemy can take that feeling of difference and say, you don't belong. When in fact, according to this portrait, it is your very difference that makes the full the fullness of Christ there in the picture. The, the picture of Christ is not complete without you and all the various giftings and, and the way you were called and the way that you're being sanctified. And so 
Uh, you, if you get nothing else out of this portrait, belong it, by faith, by, by, by grace through faith, you belong in this local picture of Jesus Christ. You belong. You're, you're needed in this picture. Christ has saved you to be in this picture. So we're going to look again at a few more characteristics this morning. And then at the end, we're going to have some time for judgment house testimony. I've, I've already heard one this morning. Uh, and so if you have something you want to share that the Lord has done to point to his power and his mightiness to save, then we would um, be glad for you to do that at the end. So let me, uh, I'm not going to read the whole passage this morning. I'm not going to read the passage. I'm going to read it as we go, okay, because we've read it before, and it is a long list of names, and I will simply remind us of the um, characteristic of this list of names. It's not merely a list of names. It's a list of names that are described, right? There's a description for each set of names or each name. And it's those descriptions that that give us the diverse colorings in this portrait. And so we're just looking at those as we go through. And I want, kind of do a Where's Waldo, okay? Except instead of Waldo, you know, be like, you know, where's Bill? And where's Nathan or Hannah and, and Jason? I'm just looking at you. Where, where am I in that portrait? Because odds are, you're either there or some of these characteristics we're going to look at today, it, it's things we aspire to be, not just things we are in the way he recreated us in Christ, but things that we can aspire and work toward uh, with all diligence. So let me pray for our time in the word, uh, because what has to happen here has to be a work of the spirit, right? All right, let's pray. Father God, I thank you that what has to happen here is not up to me. Thank you that that, um, Father, in my preparation, I trust that you've been at work, working in my heart, transforming me by your word. Uh, and Father, I pray that continue. But I, I also pray that that you work in your your people's hearts by your word, you know, by your spirit. Apply it, sink it deep, change the way we think. Father, identify us in this passage or challenge us by this passage. Maybe to look more like that transformed church that you desire us to be. Father, do your work. Show your, your might and your power to change us, to make us like Jesus, so that we will together point this broken and lost world to a Savior. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so as we have been looking through this, you know, we've noticed a number of characteristics. Today, we're going to start with the eighth characteristic that I see in this text. The eighth characteristic is to be approved, to be a, a, a part of this, this portrait. This one individual was approved. Look at verse 10 with me, and I'll read it. Verse 10 of Romans chapter 16. Romans chapter 16, verse 10. And he says, Paul says, greet Apelles, who is approved in Christ. Just a short little phrase there. Meet him, Apelles, who is approved in Christ. Now, if we just read that in a cursory way, in other words, in kind of a running way, we just like, okay, say hey to Apelles, he's approved. And you're like, okay, good deal. But let me ask the question, this hit me, aren't all the people to whom Paul is saying, give greetings, aren't they all approved in Christ? I mean, he's writing to the church, and he's very careful when he, when he mentions families. You know, he, he doesn't sometimes mention the whole family, which implies he's, he's writing to those who have come to Christ. Uh, they, at one time, were trusting in their own good works to make them approved. But now they are trusting Jesus Christ and his work on the cross to make them approved by God. So why would Paul, really it's one person out of the church in Rome. It would be like, you know, me saying, greet Josh Kerbway, greet Pastor Josh. He's approved. 
in Christ. You know, is the implication that, but you guys aren't? So I, I don't think that's what Paul's doing because his assumption is, in the sense of salvation, you're all trusting Christ. Uh, all of you who are trusting Christ in the gathering are approved. And by faith, they were all pleasing and acceptable to God. So what does Paul mean by singling out a pellet? What is he doing here? He's approved. What is he saying to us? Well, in a, in a dictionary, if you look up approved, uh, in the original language, the Greek there, the first definition of that word is always the most common, right? Any dictionary, you look up, and the first definition is going to be the most widely used usage of that word. Um, and if context doesn't point us in a different direction, it's probably the meaning of the text. So the first definition of the word approved, which is the word dokimon, sounds like Pokemon, but not, okay? Dokimon, it is, the, the, the definition is tested in battle. Now, I don't know about you, that is not where my mind went when I read in the English, Apelles, he's approved in Christ, right? But, you, but here we see it, its first meaning, its primary meaning is tested in battle reliable, trustworthy. It, turn with me to 1 Peter 1, 6 and 7. Just turn quickly to 1 Peter. It is on the screen, but I encourage you to turn there. It's good to do sword drills. 1 Peter 1, 6 through 7. Listen to what Peter says about being tested. And I only turn here because it's the same word. It's, it's dokimon, okay? Or form of it. So, Starting kind of in there a little bit, it says, Though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness, tested genuineness, that word tested is the word dokimon, approved. All right, the approved genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold, which pre which perishes, though it is tested, same word, dokimon, or form of that word, um, by fire, gold which perishes, though is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So, if as I look at this verse, it's about being tested, being found faithful, being found reliable, tested in battle, tested by fire, okay? Notice what Peter says about trials in, this, in these two verses alone. He says a lot, but just in outline form. He says trials are temporary, right? Though now for a little while. Now, some of our trials last a little longer than others, right? And, and let's just be really frank. Some are going to last until we breathe our last breath here. But even so, they're for a little while compared to eternity. They're, they're temporary. What you're going through, it will not last forever. What lasts forever is all of our inheritance with God in Christ. That is what lasts forever. So trials are temporary, even if they last to the end of this life. Number two, at times, these trials are me dead. And we don't like to hear that. They're what we need. Trials are what we need. Struggles are what we need. A lot of times, it's what other people need because they need to see us persevere to the glory of Christ. They need to see how we persevere so that they'll be able to persevere when they face that similar trial. We may need to see that God will cause us to persevere in the trial to his glory. Many of our trials are for ourselves, but I would say a majority are for others to see. You know, we may, we may, and we may not see the fruit. We'd be like, oh, God, I don't know why this is happening. There may be somebody that you don't even know is watching, and they are watching how God enables us to endure and to think little of the cross, 
to despise, right, the shame that comes with that cross. And, and there is fruit because God is at work in that trial. Now, there's another a quote in my, my Things I Can't Afford to Forget book, my little, my little book of quotes, and it says, it's better to see the power of God in the fire than to, than to avoid the fire and miss seeing God's power. That came when we were, I was preaching through Daniel, I think. And you had Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the, the, the furnace, right? Better to see God in the fire, his power, than to avoid it and miss it. So at times, trials are what you and I need, even though they're not what we want. Number three, the trials grieve us, making us sorrowful. Let's just admit, the joy we have in Christ, it is enduring, but it is not undefiled in the sense it is mixed, it is mingled, right? I've said this before. I say it repeatedly because we repeatedly go through trials and, we're, and we get discouraged because we're like, why am I going through this? My joy is struggling. Well, Peter's pretty straightforward. He goes, it makes us sad. Struggles, trials, difficulties. It's not like they don't bring sorrow. And listen, they should because they're not what God had in mind originally for his perfect creations, for his creation that he looked at and said, oh, this is Remember, he says, tov me'od in Hebrew. It is good exceedingly, but sin twisted it. And for us to go through life and not be broken over the twistedness of this creation by sin would be wrong. And so Peter says, yeah, you're going to be sorrowful over these trials. They're going to break your heart. Maybe you're going through that right now. Fourthly, it says there are all kinds of trials. If you look, it says you've been grieved by various trials. My trials may not be your trials. Your trials may not be the trials of the person next to you. And it's interesting because, you know, how am I supposed to be compassionate or empathetic when I haven't gone through the same thing they have? They're trials. They have a similar uh, consequence of sorrow. Uh, we, we know that God, we, we need them. God uses them. God works through them. But there's all kinds of trials. And then this trials prove faith to be real. Trials prove. That's the testing, right? Our faith is tested by these. And, and look, I heard this week in, in a sermon I was listening to, God does not test us wondering, I wonder if they'll pass. He knows. He tests us so that we can show him to be faithful in enabling us to persevere so that we will know that our faith, it is in God who is faithful. And so that's that word, um, the, the dokimon word. They, it's a genuine battle-tested faith, reliability, perseverance. And then finally, uh, these trials, Peter says, tested faith brings glory and praise and honor. He couldn't just say glory. He couldn't just say, he had to give this, this threefold, right? This full, when, when our faith is tested and we persevere, it brings glory to God. How do, how do we glorify God in a trial when we're sorrowful for a season? Just trust him. Just trust him. See, Paul seems to be indicating that a peles, back to Romans 16, Paul seems to be indicating that a peles has been through the fire and remain faithful. He is, he has a proven faith in a way that maybe others in Rome hadn't. You see what he's saying? He's not saying that he's approved in Christ, he's approved by God because he trusted Christ more than others. He's saying his faith. He has been through the ringer. He has come out faithful. Pelles. See, the church isn't a group of people who have all had easy lives. If you're new in church life or you're a visitor this morning and, and you're like, this group of people, they look all put together. They've got their nice clothes on. They're smiling. You should have seen us before we got out of the car. 
as we were griping at each other or you should have you shouldn't we should um you know there's a an app that that's uh it it tells you when to take a picture of yourself and you're supposed to take a picture right then to get the real you um i don't do it but if you saw me when i woke up with hair disheveled and my goodness we're we're a mess and we just need to confess it that anything good in us it is all jesus christ we the church is not a group of people who have had easy lives. It, it includes those who have gone through the fire. Maybe that's to you. Maybe you're like, I, I don't know why I am suffering so much more than everybody else. Look, I, I, I don't have the wisdom of God on that, but I know that our trials, that God is sovereign and, and our trials are needed maybe for us, but maybe for somebody else. Those who have gone through the fire are among us. Those who have been chased by Pharaoh's army. Those who have walked up to a Red Sea that needed splitting. Those who have walked through the wilderness without water, without food, and had to rely on God's provision. First Peter 4.19 let those who suffer according to God's will. What does that say to you? That God is the one who wills it. It's not that he wants us to suffer in, in a sense of taking pleasure in it, but he is wise. He knows our hearts better than we do. Let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. So don't just, don't just entrust yourself to a faithful creator and sit and trust your, faith, your soul to a faithful creator and serve. You were transformed to serve. James 1, 2, and 3. James chapter 1, verses 2 and 3. It is through being tested by trials. This is the paraphrase, all right? So if you're following along, it may be phrased slightly differently, but it is through being tested by trials that we are made steadfast and that we make progress toward being fully like Christ. That's what trials do. They make us unmovable and they make us mature like Christ. You see, the transformed in this portrait that Paul's painting are not a gathering of people with perfect, easy lives. Among the transformed are those who have suffered in being formed like Christ. Among the transformed are those who have especially walked through the fire and have been found, here's the word, up to the glory of of Jesus Christ. Not everyone in the body has been through the same trials to the same extent even. But whatever trials we do face, whatever trials you are facing, have faced, will face, may we be found approved, tested, battle tested, genuine in faith. May it be said of us, that we're approved. Second thing I noticed, that's the first word, approved. Second word, we'll just do the second one. Call. Call. Verse 13, let's read verse 13. Greet Rufus, chosen in the Lord. And we'll stop there. Greet Rufus, chosen in the Lord. What I want to look at is that word chosen or called, right? English synonyms there, chosen or called. And whereas in the last word, we kind of noticed in the body, there are those of different testing, right? Some were tested more severely, some less severely. Some had this test, other that test. But, but Apelles, he stood out as one who had endured, right? 
Well, now we're looking at this word called, and we see that in the body, there are those who have a different, um, a different clarity of their call. Some are just more, it's a more clear call. And what, what do we mean by that? Well, again, we have to acknowledge Paul wasn't saying to the church, some of you are called by Christ as Christians and others of you aren't. He wasn't saying that. Why would he call Rufus among all these called people, all in this church in Rome that were called to Christ, why would he say, oh, and there's Rufus who's called? Found that interesting. So, looked into it. Rufus may have been, and I say this, I say this um, not adamantly, okay? But it is very likely, I think, that this is the Rufus who was listed as one of the sons of the man who carried the cross of Christ. It, was, it says of Simon of Cyrene, the man who, the Romans, when Jesus could carry it no longer, you know, it said that they grabbed a man out of the crowd. It was Simon of Cyrene, and he had two sons, and one was named Rufus. Why would it record that his name was Ruf, Rufus? And then here Paul says, hey, Rufus, from, from the church in Rome. I think it probably was the same, same one. The son, they just stop and think about that for a second. To have your dad as the one who was carrying the cross of the Savior for all mankind. Now, it hit me, just, this is a rabbit, quick rabbit. Simon of Cyrene was not, in, in, in the, the, most, the most profound way, carrying Christ's cross. As he carried Christ's cross physically, Christ was about to carry his cross. Christ was about to carry Simon of Cyrene's cross. He was going to die in place of Simon and Cy of Cyrene. That was a rabbit chase. But it's a true one. So, the son of the man who carried Jesus' cross, what an inexplicably supernatural calling of this person. That, that, that God, when Christ was going to the cross, God so sovereignly said, you. And to be the son of that man that God said, you carry the cross for my son. That's a pretty amazing story, right? We, uh, have you ever like shared your testimony? And, you know, my testimony is I um, was sitting in church one Sunday night, a revival preacher that was connected with Billy Graham came to our church in Phoenix, Arizona at First Southern there. And I was sitting there next to my family and he preached. Um, and I realized I needed a savior and I walked, well, I can't say I walked my, I asked my dad if he'd carry me forward. So my dad carried, I've never actually walked the aisle to be saved. My dad carried me down the aisle to be saved because I was incredibly timid, hated being in front of people. God has a sense of humor. Um, but my testimony is a pretty normal church testimony. I grew up in a Christian family. Um, they told me about Jesus. They taught me about Jesus. I went to church. I heard about Jesus. I realized I needed a Savior. The Spirit worked, drew me to Christ. I trusted. I hear some of these stories, these testimonies, you know, about people that, that are in these incredibly broken homes where there's abuse and, and neglect and they're never, they're, you know, they wouldn't step foot in a church for anything. And God supernaturally just ordains the means that draws them out of that situation, calling them to himself. Or maybe it's a person that lives in a, in a Muslim country or some other, a country where, where Christianity is almost unheard of. And they have an experience where they they have a dream, and, and Jesus comes to them in this dream, and I, I, don't, I don't negate that. You know, they come to Christ. I'm like, wow, I want a testimony like that. This guy, Rufus, had a testimony like that. Rufus, how'd you come to Christ? Well, my dad carried the cross for Jesus. You know, that's a Pretty good testimony. And, and, and Paul, you know, maybe that's why Paul said, 
This man, Rufus, the dude is cold. It is clear. You could tell by the way he was drawn to Christ. Certainly would have been said of Paul, right? Damascus Road. The dude is walking to Damascus to imprison believers. And Jesus appears to him on the Damascus Road. And, and the people around, they, 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 they saw the light, and they, but they, they, didn't, they didn't get all that Paul got. But it was undeniable the man was called to Jesus Christ by Christ himself. Paul, why are you persecuting me? And, and, and so it certainly could be said of Paul, he was Paul, undeniably. Now, there is a, I want to offer a warning here, because it is equally impossible for anybody to come to Christ except God call him, right? Whether you come to Christ out of a, 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 a very unlikely context or maybe you come to Christ and you were in church every Sunday since before you were born it is impossible for either to come to Christ unless God draws them to Jesus but maybe it wasn't so much maybe Paul wasn't talking about Rufus's amazing call of being the son of Simon of Cyrene maybe maybe it wasn't so much his conversion that showed him to be so undeniably called. Maybe it was his sanctification. There, there are just some believers that I watch and I think to myself, man, they're the real deal. You ever thought that? You look at people and you're like, wow, that person is unmistakably child of God. They are following Jesus Christ. They are filled with the fruit of the Spirit in them, undeniably called by the way they have been changed. You ever think that? I do. And because inevitably, I look back at myself and say, what's your excuse? I mean, they, are, they love like none other. They serve like none other. They are so undeniably called. Well, whether it was the unexplainable nature of Rufus's conversion or the undeniably supernatural change in his life, Rufus stood out to Paul as one who was markedly called by God to Christ. He was the real deal. He was one who loved like Christ, had the affections of Christ, served like Christ, talked like Christ, thought like Christ, obeyed the Father like Christ. And one day likely would die like Christ, trusting and die selflessly for the kingdom. We need to be careful that we, we don't move to doubt and say, if I am chosen or if I'm elect, why do I, am I not like that person? So I want my calling to be more obvious. If you say that, if you feel that, mark of being called. So you're not going to want that on your, on your own. Listen, if you want your calling to be more obvious, if you want people to come in here and say, so-and-so is all undeniably. Have you seen them? Have you seen their service to the Lord? Have you seen their heart, their love? They are, if you want that, I've got good news for you. Peter helps us with that. Turn with me to 2 Peter 1.10. 2 Peter 1.10 says, Brothers, be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election. Do you see that? Peter's saying, look, we can become diligent to confirm that calling so that others will see us and say, Jesus is in you. Well, well how do we do that? Well, verses 3 and 4, if you go back in that chapter, it says that his divine power, God's divine power, has granted to us Everything that pertains to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence. That's the how. We have the power, or it's the means. We have the power to be one of those people in the body whom others say undeniably call. And from 3 and 4, verses 3 and 4, I get that it says God has given us all we need. Okay? You've got what you need. The power of God. 
verse 5 and 7 tells us exactly how. So you get the means in 3 and 4. Verse 5 to 7 says, make every effort to grow in, and then it says, grow in virtue, knowledge, self-control, steadfastness, godliness, familial love, and godly love. Make every effort. And what I get from that is that confirming your election, confirming my election, it's work. It takes effort. If it tells me to make every effort to confirm it, it's work. Now, let me be very clear. You're like, well, but what up? Grace. Grace. Grace doesn't exclude effort. Working out one's salvation. Grace excludes merit. Working for one's salvation. Okay? So work it out. Work hard. Make every effort to confirm your chosenness. And do it by adding these things and ultimately godly love to your faith. Well, verse 8 says one final thing. If these qualities are yours and are increasing, that tells me that growth confirms one's election. If you're at point A today, being at point B at some time in the future confirms you belong to God in Christ. Growth confirms your election. So when Paul said Rufus was called, he was likely saying that he was undeniably growing to be more like Jesus. So among the transformed, there may be those whose conversion was the most unlikely. But there will certainly be those in whom Christ's life is clear and increasing. Those who, by God's power, are making every effort to grow and their progress, as Paul said to Timothy, is evident to all. You see, we can't control how Jesus calls us to himself. Some of us are going to have these testimonies that are really unlikely. Others are going to have testimonies that, like, we, we grew up in a church home. But by his grace and power, we can confirm our calling by how we grow to be like Jesus. You see, when the Roman soldier saw Jesus die, what did he say? Surely this was the Son of God. Church family. May we be Rufuses so that the world sees the way we live and die and says, surely he or she was called of God. Will you pray with me? Father, thank you for these two, two attributes, approved, battle-tested faith and call. Father, help us to confirm our call as a body, individuals in the body, that the world might see us and say undeniably, for sure, that person is different than anybody else I've met in the world. They are called by God. Father, by your grace, by your power, your divine power that you've given to us in Christ, make it so in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray.